today we're going to talk about, honestly, um, one of the most intolerant topics I think we could ever talk about. And it's one of the most truthful topics I think we could ever talk about. It's one of those things that, that in our society, in our culture, this isn't popular. This isn't something I, I even think those of us who are of the faith have a hard time accepting and a hard time believing and, and have resistance to the idea that there is only one way. There's only one way to the Father. You know, and, and I think if, if I had it my way, I would do things differently, right? Say, we all get in, let's all have a party. But it's not my way, it's, it's his way, it's the Father's way. And it is the only way that we can be in his presence. And I think this is going to be one of the more hard-fought foundations that we as believers are going to face in the days to come. This is one of those things we need to have rock solid. Okay? And if we don't have this rock solid, the missions effort that we go and do is going to miss the door to the Father. Right? It's just going to be charity. The love that we have for our neighbor is just going to be neighbor. We might have fun for a while, but it's missing the bigger picture. That there is one way to the Father. This should be one of those foundations. And I know there are people in this room right now who wrestle with this. I myself wrestle with this intellectually. Not just intellectually, emotionally. People that I love so much. Good people. Good-natured people. People who probably live better lives than I do. Are trying to get to the Father every other way but through Jesus Christ. This is not just something that's important for right now. It's been important for all of our history. And it's honestly been something that it's not a new issue the church faces. It's an old issue, and the church has been facing it for a very long time. So today, I figure we're going to look at probably the best text about Jesus being the only way to the Father. Some of you have heard this text before the past year. I apologize for that. I couldn't teach this sermon any other way, okay? And I apologize for those who are, didn't you teach John 14 before? Yes, I did. We may come at it just a little bit differently, but guess what? I can't, under my own intellect, do anything better than John 14, verses 1 through 14. It answers all the questions we would want to have about this. And it does it in a way that is much better, much smarter than anything I could piece together. Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready to hear what Jesus says? Are you ready to hear about the way to the Father? Let's look at this. John chapter 14. Let's start in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What a wonderful place to start. Let not your hearts be troubled. That's why we can sing, it is well with our soul, right? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, how do we know where you are going? How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me 
does his works. Believe me, I am in the Father. The Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just ask that you guard this conversation that we're going to have. I ask that it is saturated in your word because you are our authority. I pray we don't listen to lies and deceptions and and sometimes that we we don't even listen to our, our own heart, but we listen to your word, your son, and your spirit. I pray, Lord Father, that we can come to accept this and that this truth can change the way that we look at those who are around us. I pray for us that we may know personally that you are our way, that you are the truth, and that you are the life, that new life that we have when we are born again. We can only have it through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for those of us who do know that and and have that truth solidified in our lives, Lord Father, that it may spur us on to see, to see a hastiness to the way we go about sharing this message, that we share it in love, we share it in truth, with gentleness and respect, but that we share it, and we share it like wildfire. We ask that today point solely to the glory of your Son, Point solely to your glory. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the foundation that we, because he said it, we're going to have to accept it. And if we don't accept what he says... We're accepting something else, okay? This is harsher than I would ever be if you and I were sitting together drinking a cup of coffee. I would come to the same conclusion, but I might do it with a little bit more love and gentleness. This is a foundation for us, and as we're going to see today, as we're going to see as we dive into what Jesus tells us in this passage, it means so much more than just our ticket into the Father's gate. It's something that, that, that honestly, it should answer these four questions. And as we look at this text, it does it so perfectly. The four questions that we have when we're talking about Jesus being the only way, the first question is only way where, right? If I'm trying to give you directions somewhere, and I'm like, there's only one way to get there. It's like, well, where is it you want us to go? Well, there's only, well, where do you want to go, right? So the first question we want to answer is where it is we want to go. The second question this text answers for us is how we can get there, okay? Where we're going and how we can get there, and it does it very well. The third question, how can we know for sure? Ross did a very good job on this question two weeks in a row, okay? So we're going to touch on it just a little bit, and I'll refer you to the authority of Ross, who did an amazing job a few weeks ago covering how we can know for sure. And the last question, For those of us who know the only way, what we can do in the meantime. Are you guys ready to go on this journey? You ready to go smile and nod or I'll stand here all day. You know I will. I'm that stubborn. Shelly, am I stubborn? Not you, Shelly. This Shelly. Am I stubborn? Yeah, I'm very stubborn and uh, stubborn. (laughs) I've passed this trait on to all my kids. Open up to John chapter 14. We'll start in verse 1, we'll read 2, 3, and 4 again, even though we read it before, I'm going to read it again because it is so good. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, 
you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. The first question that we want to look at is where? Where is the only way? And, and as we see in this text, he tells us right off the bat, right? He tells us his father's residence. He says, in my father's what? In my father's house are many rooms. In my father's residence. In my father's place. Wow. Now, let's just talk a little bit about misconceptions that we have about his father's residence, okay? Now, I know a lot of times in our culture and in, 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 in our language, the King James Version translated this Greek word as mansion one time. But the word itself really means, in Greek, just a residence, a place of dwelling, okay? We have a misconception sometimes. We have a misconception that because it was translated in English as a mansion, that each and every one of us are getting a mansion somewhere, right? And if you heard this type of thinking, that the work that you do here makes an even better and bigger and more beautiful mansion for you there later, this is not thinking that's supported in Scripture. Now, I can understand why they talk about a mansion, right? A place with many rooms has got to be huge. And what do we call a huge house with many rooms? I don't call it my house. I call it a mansion. It's the kind where you're driving down the street and you're like, hey, honey, look at that mansion. He's like, oh, man, if we only live there, hey, there's going to be a day and we're going to live in a big, big mansion and all my crazy relatives are going to live with me. And if you guys don't have crazy relatives in the faith, you do have one now. Ha, 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 it's me. There is going to be a residence, the father's residence, that he is at. And it's not something that we work to for a better place. It's a place that he is building for us. It is his residence. It's his presence. It's his dwelling place. It's a place where his spirit is. He is going there to his father's residence, and he's doing stuff there. What is he doing for us at his father's residence? He is preparing a place for us. Jesus himself prepared a place for us in this residence with many rooms. In my father's house are what? Many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? He is going to prepare a place for us in God's presence, a place with many, many rooms. Now, a place with many, many rooms, I tend to believe there's enough room for each and every person who believes in Jesus Christ, and he can always add another room in another place. It's like in Minecraft. You could just keep building and building and building. For those of you who don't know Minecraft, you I play video games. I don't know if you know that every now and then. It used to be my absolute favorite game. But it was a place, a place where you could just build anything at any time out of whatever you find. This place that is being built has rooms. And if, if more people want to come, he will prepare another room. He will prepare another room for you. It's his father's residence. It's prepared for us by Jesus. It's prepared for us by his miraculous birth. He was born of a virgin, and that's miraculous. That should make us go, wow, what? That's impossible. No, it is possible only through God's miraculous power. He prepared a way for us, not just through his birth, but through the perfect life that he lived while he was here on earth. He did not break God's desire, God's plan for his life. From the day he was born to the day that he died. He did it the way we couldn't do. But he did it on our behalf. Because he died a death as if he had broken the law. As he had broken those things. If he lived an imperfect life. He was born miraculously. He lived perfectly. And he died on for our behalf, as if he did, which he didn't break his law. Now, his death wasn't the end of it, because he conquered death. He came back to life. 
Jesus prepared a way, prepared this place through his birth, through his life, through his death on our behalf and his resurrection. He prepared this place for us on our behalf through his life. That should get you excited. Gets me excited. It's a place that he prepared for us through his life, and it's a place for not just him, not just the 12 who followed him, but all who believe in him. This is a place with tons and tons of room, and they can add more. They can add so much more. It's a place that he is preparing that we can be in his presence. The fall in the garden, man was in God's presence. But because of the fall, because of the disobedience that we had, and mankind had, people were separated from God. There's coming a day that God, through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, that we will be back into his presence and that we can have his presence in us with his spirit. We will eternally be in this place that he is preparing for us in his presence. It's a place of unspeakable joy, love, complete newness and renewal of all things, glory, splendor, beauty, all cleanness, wow, worship, it's a place that doesn't have a temple because we're always going to be in his presence. Or it's just going to be one huge temple. It's going to be a place without death, a place without pain, sorrow, crying. If we're using language to describe the wants and desires that we have right now, the place that he is preparing for us would be a place that would have all of those things that make your heart sing right now. Okay? It'd be like Jesus saying, hey, Tim... I have prepared a place for you. It's got a huge TV on it. It's got an Xbox. It's got all you can eat, chips and salsa and cheese dip and burritos. It's got all the books you could ever want to, to ease your curious mind. It's got golf clubs for you if you want to go out and swing the stick around and get a little frustrated sometime. It's got Doug. It's got your fishing gear in there. Okay, Ross has got some more golf clubs in there. It would have the desires of our heart using that language for what we desire now. But it would be completely different because our desires would be different, right? That Xbox, that because of the desires that I have now, that is like, oh, man, we got this Xbox waiting for me. No, it's like, when would I be bored and want to play an Xbox if I was completely in his presence? When would I want a burrito and chips and salsa if all my needs were fulfilled in him, the food? I wouldn't want food. I would be in his presence all the time. That curiosity, that not like I want to know stuff. I want to read these books. I just ask him. I'd be in his presence. The desires that I have here on earth would be completely fulfilled because I would be in his presence and it would be as he designed it in the garden when all that we could ever need was there. Wow, and it can all be filled, and we can all get there in one way. And that is through Jesus Christ. It's a place prepared not for our faulty desires that we have now, but our fulfilled desires that we will completely have perfected up there. It is a place. Now that we have talked a little bit about where Jesus is going to his father's residence, the place that is prepared through his life that has rooms, lots of rooms, even more rooms can be added on, place in God's presence where all our desires can be fulfilled perfectly. Let's talk about how we can get to that place. Jesus said to his disciples, because one of his disciples asked a question, Thomas, what do we know about Thomas? He's called Doubting Thomas. It means he likes to ask really good questions. Thomas asked this question, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Good question, right? Know where you're going. How do we get there? Jesus answered him. He says, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to the Father's presence except what? Except through me. There's no other way because he 
is our way. He is how we can get there. He is our way for several reasons. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He, talking about Jesus, has made the Father known, has made him known. Jesus, in Jesus' bodily life, reveals to us God. Okay? We can't see God, but when we look at Jesus, God put on flesh. Jesus reveals to us God visibly. That's one way he is our way. He reveals to us visibly who God is. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Through Jesus' death, we have a way to the Father. We have access to the Father. Not only do we have access to the Father, but we have been made clean through him. And that is why we can have access to the Father. His perfect life is counted to us who have lived imperfect lives since the day we were born. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. His cleanness, our dirtiness, is taken away. And his cleanness is shown through on us. We have access to the Father's presence, and we have our way to him through Jesus' perfect death. He is our way also. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he, being Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is also our way to the Father. He's our way that we know our prayers can be answered. Why? Because he is our intercessor. He's praying on our behalf. He's up there, it says, at the Father's side. How many of you ever felt like your prayers don't get answered? I've felt that way myself, but I know that Jesus Christ is my intercessor, and he is sitting at God's side. And the things that I'm asking through this intercessor, Jesus there is saying, hey, God, Tim's praying for this. And God, what do you think? No, Tim's being very selfish right now. Let's not do that. He wants another Xbox or burrito or something. Let's not do that. Or, hey, God... I I really want to see this come true for this person. I want to see their lives completely changed by your son, Jesus Christ. Please, Jesus at the Father's right-hand side says, you know what? I think we can do that. He is our way to the Father. He's at the Father's right hand interceding, praying on our behalf. He is our way to God's, to God's presence. He is our way that our prayers will be answered. He is our mediator, our intercessor. He is not just our way. He is the truth, the knowable truth, the truth that we can cling to, the truth that we can know, the truth that can set us free. John 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know what? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you you free. Jesus is not just our way, but he is the truth. And these truthful words that are coming out of his mouth when he says, I am your only way to the Father, he's not lying to you. When you listen to what Jesus says and you listen to his words, when you listen to the Father's words, it's not deception. Whenever you're hearing something that is contrary to his word, that's the lie and that's the deception. Because he is the truth. The truth is knowable through God's word, and it will set us free. And sometimes we look at it, oh, if we obey God's law, it's just like putting more chains on us. And that is completely opposite to what he says. He says, you will know the truth, and it will set you free. He is the way. He is the truth. The truth is knowable. You can know it, pick it up, you can study it, you can ask questions. Not only can you know it, it will set 
you free. He is not just our way. He is not just the truth. He is the life. Somebody preached a really good sermon last week of being dead and being made alive, being born again. That new life that we have from our former dead life, he is now made new. In him, we have that life, that new life, that new life in his presence. He is our way. He is the truth. He is the life, the new life that we have in him. Our old life is dead. It is buried. And our new life, our new wants and our new desires, our new everything is found in him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is that life. That perfect life that he lived that we could never do is counted to us. He is our way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. It is only through Jesus. It is only through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. We, we could just look at this one verse, okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and say, well, this verse is in isolation. We can't build good theology on just one verse that stands alone, right? We, we shouldn't do that. Well, unless it's coming straight from God's mouth himself, then we should take it with a little bit more acceptance. But this verse itself is not in isolation. It's not the only place that we see this. John 3, 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This verse tells us that all people are condemned. And the only way to not be condemned is through Jesus Christ. It's as if there's fire everywhere and all of us are in it. But there's a clearly marked exit that we can get to. And it's like, hey, buddy, just go through that door and you don't have to face any of this. Because we're all facing this anyway. No one can come to him except the Son of God. John 10, verse 7, 8, and 9. Jesus said again to him, truly, truly say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. What's really neat is if you look up what he's talking about, like a sheepfold is like this, this stone engraving, and there's this really narrow door, okay? And what would happen is a shepherd would stand at that door, okay? Sheep would come in for safety, they would go out to eat, and they would hang out, and the shepherd would hang out there to make sure that this happened. Now, sometimes thieves would try to steal the sheep, okay? Sheep are valid, but if there's a dude standing there at the door, he's not going to let the shepherd come in and out, or the thieves come in and out. They are going to protect from the thieves. Jesus says, I am that door. I will let the sheep come in. To, I will let them go to the pasture. I will protect them from the thieves. I am that door. He doesn't say there are other doors. There are multiple doors. He says, oh, well, if you don't like this door, there's a prettier door around on the side. No, I am that door. He, Mark 14, sorry, Mark 14, verse 35 and 36. This is right before Jesus is going to be crucified. This is right before, this is when he is praying in the garden and he is praying to God. And he says something very, very, very clear. He says, Mark chapter 14, verse 35. Going a little bit further, Jesus fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. He said, God, 
Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, not that I will, but what you will. Jesus himself, before he went to the cross, sat and prayed, God, if there's any other way besides me, you can do all things. God, if there's any other way besides this painful death that I'm about to face, if there's any other way that your people can come to you, make it happen. You can do all things. And Jesus at his prayer says, not what I will, but what you, being God, will. There was no other way. Even Jesus prayed that if there was, God would make it available. And Jesus recognized God's will. And Jesus went to that cross. Went to that cross knowing the pain he was about to face. The death he was going to have. But he did it on the behalf of those who believe in him. If you believe in him, he did that knowing you. Wow. Yeah. Acts 4, 12. There's no salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 5-6. through 6, There is one God. There is one mediator between God and men. That man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. This isn't in isolation. It isn't something that we just made up. It's his words. And we are blessed that he record, that it was written down on our behalf that we might know and know freely. And that asks that question, how can we know for sure? How can we know for sure that he is the truth and the way? John 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Wow. How can we know for sure that he is the only way? Well, we know because he is our authority. His word tells us, and we can trust him. His word. Ross has done an amazing job for two solid weeks letting us know that his word is the truth, his word is authority. It's something that we can trust on. Something that even if we don't like it or don't understand it, if we look at it and we truly seek God's heart, it's here and it's revealed to us. God tells us, Jesus tells us, the Spirit even confirms it. And if you see in Acts elsewhere, the Spirit testifies there is only one way. We can trust him. We can appeal to his word because it is our authority. It is why I'm not trying to tell you philosophical arguments about why Jesus is better from someone else. I'm letting you see God's own word when he says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to him except through Jesus Christ. The Father and Jesus are one. The words the Father says are authority. The words that Jesus says are our authority. Jesus and the Father aren't in disagreement about this. The Spirit testifies to it. The Father's words and works are displayed clearly in Jesus Christ. And this is how we can know for sure. And even then, it's echoed elsewhere, not just here. Lastly, let's look at this last question. What can we do in the meantime? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do in greater works then these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So what can we do in the meantime? Because Jesus died, and he's going to prepare a place for us in God's presence. And we, as we live our lives, there's this place up there prepared for us, and, and we live our lives right now, and if you believe in Jesus Christ, there's a room prepared for you. If you believe he is the way, the truth, and the life, that room is there. For those of us who believe that, that room is there, and, and we're living our life, and sometimes we live our lives not even recognizing that we have a job to do while we are here. And John continues to tell us there are things for us to do while we are waiting for that day. 
says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do what? Do the works that I do. Let's go walk on water. You guys want to do that? I'd love to do that. That'd be a lot of fun. I, I can't do that unless the Spirit helps me out. But there are things that I can do. The works that he has asked us to do. The works that he's not just asked us to do, the works he has commanded us to do. We like to talk about that big one, right? About going and making disciples of all nations, right? It's kind of the purpose of our church is to, to go and do those works, right? We want to go and take that message with people. We can, in the meantime, we not just can, we should, we need to, we're told to. We need to be doing these works that point to him. Through the way that we live our lives, through the words that we speak, we need to be doing the works that he was doing. The works that point to his glory, to his kingdom, to him being the only way. We need to not just do works. Sometimes it's just not enough. You can do a whole lot to tell someone, just show someone that, that God loves them. But there's got to come a time whenever you say there is only one way to the Father. We can share about the way. I mean, if you think about this being a foundational truth, that there is only one way to the Father, and if people aren't going through that one way, this should energize you to tell people about that way. If I looked at my friend and they were standing out just lollygagging in the middle of the street and I saw a huge truck coming before them, I was like, hey, buddy, you need to get out of the way. Hey, buddy, just step aside. This truck's going to kill you. No, I need to say, hey, buddy, this truck is coming. It's going to kill you. Get out of the way. He's like, oh, I don't know what I'm... No, buddy, there is one way for you to live, okay? Because if you stay where you are, you're going to die, and this truck is going to get you. Move! Now, sometimes when we go out to do this, we do this very aggressively, which we need to, hastefully. But we need to do this with love and truth, gentleness and respect. We need to tell them the truth. We don't need to lie. We need to say there is one way, but sometimes it might be several conversations over coffee. Some of them might get heated. It might take several years. We need to share that he is the way. And lastly, this verse tells us, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. It's kind of building up on what we're talking about next week in the promise of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We need to do the works that point to him. We need to share about the way, and we need to boldly ask for victory in his name. I love this quote from John Piper. In my name, that is for my fame, not your fame, for God's fame, not our fame. Because of my divine worth, my infinite payment on the cross, according to my sovereign wisdom, put every request through that filter. His fame, his worth, his purchase, his wisdom, every prayer will be answered. You will have everything you need to do the works that I do, even the greater works. If we are constantly praying for his fame, not ours, his glory, not ours, his notoriety, his kingdom. And we start to ask for things that glorify, magnify him, things in his name. Those things will be answered for us. And, and those greater works that Jesus even says we'll do, greater works we will do, will be done. This brings us to the, the, the end, okay? This is the chunk in the meat, and I promise this is the end. I went a little long, but we're going to feed you, okay? So you can't complain too much. Delicious food. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 this is something that we at Mission Point Church were very familiar with. We have bracelets with this around our wrist. We're trying to teach you missionaries to memorize this verse and be able to share it. To share that, that wages of that sinful life is what? It's death. But this free gift of God, 
The place he is preparing for us is only available through Jesus Christ. The gift of God is our eternal life in Christ Jesus. There is only one way to receive this gift. And that is believing in Jesus Christ, confessing with your mouth and with your heart who he truly is. Believing that he is your way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. When you go from death to life, when you're born again, it can only happen. You can only be in his presence. You can only receive this truth through Jesus Christ. This is the most important message that we have. And today you have an opportunity. If you want to accept this gift, you want to confess that you believe in Jesus Christ, see me, I'll be standing right over there, and we can get this work out. Somebody else is talking to me, there will be other men in this room that you could talk to. But today, if you know you haven't gone through the way, let's set it straight and let's do this today. If you have done this, and you know you are going through Jesus Christ, you know you are forgiven, you know you are made new, you know you are a new creation, who have you shared this with? Who do you need to share this with? Let's begin praying. Let's begin praying for opportunities to share this important message. This important message that there is only one way to the Father. There are people around us who think, and there might even be people in this room who think there is certainly other ways. God does not lie to us. His Son does not lie to us, and His Spirit does not lie to us. There is only one way, and it is through Jesus Christ. Every judgment in Scriptures is not, here's the Baptists, the Pentecostals, here's Muslims over here, here's Baptists. No, it's those who have gone through the door and everyone else. Wow. Wow. There is only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your Son. Oh my gosh, but thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He did what we couldn't do, and he did it on our behalf. And now whenever you look at us, you see that part, that life that he lived. You see his righteousness, not our failures, not our sin. That has all been forgiven and set aside. I pray and I plead that if there's anyone in here who is trying to get to you through any other means, that they stop, that they listen to your word, that they choose to believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and they do it today. I pray that we, as your believers, as your followers, can take this truth to those who need to hear it. That we may proclaim boldly that there is only one way to you. It doesn't matter how good or rich or whatever people are. If they have not gone through your son, Jesus Christ, they are not going to be at that place you have prepared for them. There is another place. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made whenever you gave us your son. We thank you for this time. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.